Welcome to Wall Street Notes. Let's start with a few basics. Interest rates are what we use to move money through time. If you invest $100 today and want to make 10% on that investment, just multiply by 1 plus the required return. This gives us a future value of $110 in one year. It works the other way around too. If you divide $110 by 1 plus R, it equals $100. In other words, any investor with a required return of 10% should be indifferent between $100 today or $110 a year from now. This is the reasoning behind the future value formula. Let's do a quick example. If you are receiving $100 in four years and have a required return of 10%, how much would you be willing to pay for that today? Divide by 1 plus R four times, which is the same as using this formula. Either way, the present value should be equal to 68.3. Also, remember that the required rate of return is also known as the discount rate or opportunity cost. What is the formula for the nominal risk-free rate? It is simply the real risk-free rate plus the expected inflation. But inflation is not the only thing that investors must take into account. Investors require a return that is equal to the nominal rate, but they also add a premium to compensate for a security's default risk, liquidity risk, and maturity risk. So, that's how investors calculate the required return on a given security. The higher the risks, the higher the return that each investor will demand. Take a look at this table. What's the liquidity risk premium? Well, investment 2 is identical to investment 1, except for its low liquidity. So the difference between their returns is the liquidity premium. 0.5% is the extra amount that investors require because investment 2 is less liquid. Moving on to compounding. Let's say you invest $100 today and will receive 10% in interests per year. Does that mean that you receive $10 this year and $10 next year for a total of $120? Not exactly. That would be the simple interest. So now let's look at how compounding works. You can visualize it here. You earn 10% the first year. So you end up with $110 at the end of the year. And then you earn 10% on that entire amount on the second year. That's what it means to compound. You're earning interest on previous interests. The frequency of compounding is where it gets a little tricky. One of the best things you can do in time value of money questions is to draw a timeline and use your calculator to save time. So let's say you invest $100,000 in a four-year security with an annual rate of 10%, compounded quarterly. How much will you have at the end of four years? You can use these buttons on the calculator to solve time value of money problems. So let's figure this out. One thing you should remember is that all of your inputs must match your compounding frequency. In this case, it's quarterly compounding. So let's start with N which is the number of periods. And remember that it's not four years, it's actually 16 quarters. I is not the annual rate of 10%, but rather the quarterly rate, which is 2.5. Remember to enter the interest rate as a whole number, not a decimal. The present value is 100,000, and don't forget to make it negative because it's a cash outflow. When money leaves your wallet, it's a negative cash flow, Whenever you earn money back, it's a positive cash flow. If you ever get error 5 on your calculator, you most likely forgot a negative sign. Payment is zero because you're not earning any payments throughout the life of the security. And finally, click the compute button and then the future value button to solve for the future value. We will look at a few more of these questions later on. Some students tend to get confused with the following terms. Effective annual rates, also known as EAR or EFF. Stated annual rates, which is the same as APR or nominal rate. And periodic rates, 
So let's clarify what each of these are. The relationship between the effective annual rate, the stated annual rate, and the periodic rate is given by these formulas. Pause the video if you need to, but it will be much easier to remember with an example. Let's say you have a periodic rate of 2%, compounded semi-annually. Let's place it on the timeline. What's the stated annual rate and the effective annual rate? The APR is easy. It's just the periodic rate times the number of periods. So 2% times 2 periods equals 4%. You can think of it as the simple interest, which has no compounding. And what about the EFF? Well, we have $1, and we're compounding at the periodic rate of 2% for two periods. Let's plug in 2% in the timeline. That gives us an effective return of 4.04%. Notice that we could have just used the formula if you prefer. The reason why the APR is smaller than the effective rate is because the APR uses simple interest while the effective rate takes compounding into account. Think you've got it? Let's try another example to reinforce the concept. Assume you have two securities with the same effective rate of 10%. The first security has semi-annual compounding, while the second has quarterly compounding. What are their annual stated rates and their periodic rates? Pause the video if you want to solve it on your own, and then check your work. First, let's find the periodic rates by solving for R in this equation. Once you have the periodic rates, you can multiply them by the number of periods to get the APR. Here are the solutions. You should also remember that as compounding frequency increases, the stated annual rate gets smaller, while the effective rate gets larger. This next learning objective asks you to solve an actual problem. So let's say you want to have $7,000 saved up four years from now. Your account has a stated annual rate of 10% per year with monthly compounding. How much must you invest today to meet your goal? They are essentially asking for the present value. First things first, remember that we are compounding monthly, so you must enter monthly values in your calculator. This is a common mistake, so don't fall for it. N would be 48 months. The interest rate should be monthly as well. There are no in-between payments and future value is 7,000. Then you just compute the present value. Now let's cover annuities. Annuities are basically a set of equal cash flows that occur at equal intervals over a set period of time. Let's look at them in practice. Suppose that five years from now, your child will be going to college. You will have to pay $20,000 per year for four years. The interest rate on investments is 8% annually, so how much would you have to invest today to have enough money to send your child off to college? Before anything else, draw a timeline. Notice that here we have an annuity. It is an equal stream of cash flows of $20,000 for four years. Using your calculator to get the present value will save you a lot of time, so let's plug in the following. N is 4 years. The required rate is 8. Payment is negative 20,000. Future value is 0, and we need to compute the present value. Now, where in the timeline would you place this present value? Remember that the calculator gives you the present value at one period before the first payment. So, let's place it at time 4 which is one period before the first cash flow is due. 66,000 is the present value of the annuity at time four, but we still need to bring it all the way back from year four to year zero. Let's bring that back to time zero. All you need to do is discount the 66,000 at 8% for the remaining four years. If you prefer, you can use your calculator again to bring the amount back from year four to year zero. Here are the keystrokes. Regardless of which method you use, this is your present value at time zero. That's how much you need to invest today so that you can cover your child's college tuition in the future. How does an ordinary annuity differ from an annuity due? 
An ordinary annuity is where the first cash flow occurs at the end of the period, whereas in an annuity due, the first cash flow occurs immediately. But why would that be a problem? For the ordinary annuity, the calculator will give you the present value at time zero, which is one period before the first payment is due. But for the annuity due, the first payment happens at the beginning of the period, so we need the present value at the same time as that first payment, not one period before. So what can you do? Well, if you get a problem with an annuity due, you can use your calculator and solve for the present value as if it were a regular annuity. Then hop one year forward by multiplying the result by 1 plus r. The second way to solve an annuity due is by using the begin function on your calculator. With this function enabled, you can solve with the time value of money buttons as if it were a normal annuity, and the calculator will automatically compute values as an annuity due. However, you have to be very careful with this function. You must remember to exit the function because if not, your calculator will be stuck on that setting. So double check that the letters BGN are not on the screen anymore after exiting the function. The next item we need to review is the perpetuity. It is basically a stream of equal, infinite cash flows. Unlike an annuity, the payments go on for infinity. Let's say you buy a note that will pay $10 per year, indefinitely, so, forever. Your required rate of return is 8%. Find the present value. You should know the formula for the present value of a perpetuity. It is simply the payment divided by the discount rate. But be careful here. If payments are received semi-annually, you would divide the stated rate by 2. If they were monthly, you divide it by 12 and so on. Also, remember that the numerator is an actual dollar amount, not a percentage, and don't forget to enter your rate of return as a decimal. So let's plug in the values. The present value of this perpetuity is equal to 125, and just like a regular annuity, the present value for a perpetuity is given one period before the first payment. Take a look at this stream of unequal cash flows. If you want to find the present value, you cannot use the time value of money buttons on the calculator because the payments aren't equal. You can find the present value one of two ways. The first is to discount every single cash flow individually and then get the sum of all the present values, but this wastes a lot of time. So instead, you can go the faster route and use the CF function in your calculator. Here are the calculator keystrokes that tell you what buttons to press, and the display which shows you what your calculator screen should show. Remember to clear your work first. The initial cash flow has a value of zero, then press the down arrow, and input negative 1000 as the cash flow for year one, then press the down arrow twice, and keep doing this until you have input all the cash flows. Then simply compute the net present value, which should be equal to 381. You're doing great. Click the next video to continue reviewing. For more videos like these, go to wallstreetnotes.com and master the entire CFA curriculum by watching simple animated videos.